Welcome to Ed Talks. I'm with my friend, Tom Andrioli, and we are going to talk about this new concept that Tom really turned me on to, and that was interactive or immersive education. So Tom, welcome to Ed Talks. Ed, thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, so you and I have known each other for quite some time. And I think actually the first time like we super connected, we're on the same advisory board for a for a vendor company. And I remember hearing you speak and I was like, dang, uh, that person is really smart. I need to get to know him and, and glean whatever I can from him. And so since then, we've had this uh, relationship. You have a podcast and I was your guest and you've been a podcast of dig on my digital voices as well. So people can look you up uh, and yeah, so and then we met recently at Becker's. And so we just, you know, learned from one another and it's been a great relationship. Then we were joined by Chris Ross that morning at breakfast and, and it was great just all of us uh, catching up. So super appreciate you being here. And we'll get into your background and stuff here in a second um, before we jump right into the immersive education uh, part of it. But I always like to ask people this question. What's been your best customer experience lately? So it doesn't have to be health tech. It could be whatever, but a good customer experience. Yeah, it kind of blends, uh, you know, the world that I'm in right now, right? So um, I would say that it's, uh, we had for our students, right? So, you know, the institution that I'm at has 37,000 students, as well as, you know, a health delivery organization, research and education. So we had a mental health innovation challenge for our students. So let our students really design how we could best support their mental health, innovative ideas, maybe even something that was fundable out of it. And we had such an amazing response, right? So we had 32 teams submit into the, you know, into the kind of innovate the challenge itself. They had, we had judges, two rounds, real prize money to quote unquote, develop their prototypes and then, you know, pitch their final solutions. But the customer moment was really the finals where we had, in addition to, five finalist teams pitching to a panel of VCs and subject matter experts. We had 275 kids show up to cheer on the teams. Mm -hmm. And it was, the reason I, I pulled that one out is because it was kind of, there was an agency among the students and a real different mentality from, let's say the generation you and I grew up in where you didn't talk about these things, you hid them behind your mask. Mm -hmm. And the lean in, to be open about the topic and the lean in to support each other was just an amazing moment and really taught me something about how to leverage today's young generation as talent and not just look at them as someone who's passively getting an education with us. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And I think that's going to bleed into this couple of questions I have for you on why you're sort of double down on the educational side. So tell us a little bit about your role because you have so many uh, you're so interesting, and, and we'll get into sort of your personal professional journey, but for the audience that may not know you, share a little bit about your role, because it's quite expansive and uh, very unique. Yeah, it's unique uh, by design. We wanted something that was different, that recognizes the, you know, the impactful way technology and data are driving the way that organizations work and how they deliver value to their customers and stakeholders. And so, uh, you know, my, my role is as a, a vice chancellor over technology and data topics and programs uh, for the external world. I usually call myself the, teach, the chief digital officer because it's that, you know, the outside world, the business world kind of understands what that role typically is trying to do. And, you know, because of the nature of the type of uh, organization and institution we are, you know, I can touch topics related to operations on campus or at the health system, research, sponsored research, teaching and education, healthcare delivery, uh, and also our industry engagement and partnerships. And so it kind of have this, you know, kind of lens of uh, platform that I can jump into any topic based on what is important and strategic to us and really think about, you know, how is technology and, and, and data and value propositions evolving in this, you know, uh, age of intelligence? So, Tom, before we jump in and kind of the sec my second teaser there, I'm curious, is there something that your parents sort of forced on you growing up, you know, because we're talking here about education and stuff, uh, forced on you growing up that you weren't really happy about it at the time, but now as an adult, you look back and say, oh, that wasn't so bad, or I'm glad they did that. Yeah, there, there is. There, there actually is. I, you know, it's not the playing the guitar, 
I hated that, and I never picked one up afterwards. So that's not going to be the one. I think you know the the thing my parents did at the time. I I, I didn't I, I didn't like it. I didn't appreciate, but it, it's paid dividends. And I'll give you one tangible example how it paid dividends. Is um, yeah, I grew up my early years in kind of a city, an urban environment, and then my father took a transfer and moved me to yeah a more rural environment. So the town I spent most of my formative years living in uh, was a thousand people. Uh, and four school, four towns came together to to uh, you know constitute a high school uh, that uh, went from seven to twelve, and uh, had typically graduating classes of between eighty and ninety kids. Uh, yeah. And and so um, I was you know I was like the traditional multi sport playing a sport or a year athlete, and so my reputation was really built around I was a really good athlete and really recognized, always even playing up. And so I was known within that school district as going to be like, you know, the coming, the coming athlete who was going to bring great things. My parents, looking through a different lens, as we do as parents, you know, said uh, the education that you're getting here is just not, you know, they, they saw that the kids who graduated from that environment just were not getting the type of opportunities they wanted for their kids. And so they made real financial sacrifices uh, and, and, and family sacrifices to get me to a private high school mm. that was about 25 miles away. Uh, I didn't appreciate that because I was being uprooted from what I knew where my friend network was thrown in into this environment with a, with a very different demographic from where I was coming from. Um, and, you know, uh, it was a college prep environment, right? So a very different environment and put upon me not only to kind of reestablishing, you know, my athletic prowess and reputation, which I did because it's kind of the ambition that was always inside me, but it developed the other side, not just the intellectual, but a very specific example is um, during my sophomore year, I was asked to get up and make a presentation in front of my entire class, you know, class of about 200 people, which public speaking is, is, you know, is, is, you know, um, let's say, you know, paralyzing for most people, but then to have to do it at age 15 in front of one's peers, but, you know, that experience kind of taught me about a different way to reach people and to be recognized and actually kind of start probably started me my first ability to understand what leadership could be you know, outside of being captain of a, of, a, of, a, of a team. And so that's why I say my parents pushed me something that I never would have done myself, but it really created a different trajectory for me. Yeah, that, that's a really good, really good example. Anything else you want to share with us? on your personal professional journey before we sort of dub, double down on a uh, higher ed? No, just, you know, just, you know, a kind of, you know, I, I feel like uh, at this point in my career, and you and I've talked about this, right. As, as you have had these different opportunities, you know, um, you, you gain this kind of perspective of different environments, different techniques, different challenges that you've overcome successes and failures give you this robust toolbox to be able to, cobble together what is necessary for the situation. And I think, you know, just my background of having been a, a technology functional executive, like a chief information officer, having been a business executive run software and software as a service teams, having worked on four continents, you know, I, I just, you know, I come at any problem kind of standing back and saying, let's, let's understand, you know, and then what kind of things can I bring to the table that my past has kind of helped me develop and be ready to share into this one? So I think that's, you know, all that kind of comes into why this type of role at this point in my career. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know that's one thing I want to talk about when we get to sort of the leadership part, but we sort of there uh, already. So we're, we're just going to keep driving down this and we'll circle back on the immersive education in a second. But yeah, advice for aspiring leaders who want to be like you, you know, or not Tom specifically, or maybe. Uh, but, you know, in such a role, and I think you highlighted one already, and that is get this vast amount of experience in your youth, you know, your 20s and 30s and 40s, you're building your career, you're getting all these different experiences that you've had. And then, like you're saying, you could, the world is your oyster, you know, you could, you've got all these tools experience and you can, you can do anything and be super creative. But what, what else? So that was really good. Uh, is there anything else that you would say to aspiring leaders? Yeah, I think, you know, um, one of the things I would say, and, and you know this, right? You know, one of the things that the university and my role before this one gave me the opportunity was to build a leadership academy for technology professionals, right? You know, we started thinking about growing our own next generation of CIOs and to have technology leaders who could go out and really help the business uh, understand how to leverage technology strategically. 
I, I would say the thing that I learned in, in the difference I see in some of people as they navigate their careers, one is uh, the a lot of people are unwilling to take risks. Yeah. You know, and and I think this this idea of uh, taking risks is part of the journey. Learning and struggle is part of the journey. Uh, learn to not be afraid of that. See the upside more than the downside. I see a lot of people kind of turn away from op- what I would consider opportunity because they're just they're afraid of it not working out. And the second thing is is, is that as you become more comfortable and kind of know kind of where your strengths are, I, I think that you develop this confidence that it doesn't the career doesn't need to be a ladder. It, it you know I think of the career as being more of a rock climbing expedition where you swing from ledge to ledge and not every move makes the most sense, you know, or makes sense from a ladder climbing mentality. It, you know, and I think that has benefited me and say, I can say it's like, I've been a chief information officer. I've also been a general manager of a software business. I've worked in Europe. I've worked in Asia. Yeah. You know, they weren't always promotions, Yeah. you know, in the sense of the title that went along with it, the responsibility went along with, and sometimes even the compensation. Uh, and I think that also, you know, has ultimately paid dividends for me because it makes me uh, a, a little more agile. And in today's world, agility and bringing agility into an organizational setting is something that's valued. But I think a lot of people think just too linearly versus, you know, kind of three dimensionally about their career. Yeah, that's so good. I was taking some of my, my own notes here. Uh, <laughs> that was really good. So. Yeah, let's go into immersive education. So I think we established pretty well about uh, who you are and and sort of uh, why your interest and focus in education and, and the importance of this broad background and capabilities. So what is immersive education? Because this was new to me, but I loved it so much. But can you share with us what it is? Yeah, I mean, most of us have experienced this in, in one way, shape or form, right? So it's, it, it, the, the kind of a simple way to think about it is that, you know, we've all spent the last you know, generation, generation and a half interfacing with the internet, you know, and that's a two dimensional experience, right? We have, you know, uh, you know, you and I are in one right now over Zoom, uh, which is essentially we're using technology and these wires across the world that are connecting us and we're having a two dimensional experience. Well, now pull your mind back and think about a three dimensional experience with that, you know, immersive meaning you're in the environment. Some of us may have experienced that with, you know, uh, having, a, a, you know, a, a meta Oculus 2 headset and being inside of immersive world that way. Some of us have experienced it in some type of gaming capacity. Maybe we've been involved in some type of digital twin and done a walkthrough, right? But the immersive part is really kind of bringing two-dimensional internet into a three-dimensional setting. And so we're going to see, you know, we're already seeing applications in this. Right. Uh, some of the first are in things like media and entertainment. We're seeing in, in some industrial capacities with, you know, uh, digital twins is usually a term that the industrial uh, Internet crowd uses. Uh, but, you know, in education, what that means is thinking about now this immersive experience of a different way of giving people an opportunity to learn. And so what that, you know, what that means, and, and I'll talk about kind of the first class, right, because this is this is a bleeding edge, you know, uh, technology, right? Uh, and I can say that because we're in the middle of actually using it in a classroom setting, and it is not as simple as opening up your laptop right. and connecting on Zoom and having a nice, nice conversation like you and I are having uh, with video quality uh, and audio quality. There's a lot of technical support background things go wrong and then there's a whole redesign and so we we decided to dip our toe in this be an early adopter to understand and figure out how it was going to affect the university experience not just in the classroom which is where we started but also about the way that students experience the university learn about the university and figure out if it's the right place for them to spend part of their life and so our first foray into that, uh, with the help of a couple of technology partners, is uh, a, a class taught under the business school called Into the Metaverse. Uh, and um, it's basically 40 students in the class. We started with only wanting to do 20. We expanded it to 40 for the interest. I would go back to 20 if I had a chance opportunity because 40 is just double the number of technical headaches. Yeah. But the whole idea is that the students in that class are going to spend, you know, the class and their assignments and their presentations and their classroom discussions 
inside a three-dimensional world. So in, let's say let's say inside the metaverse, right? I tend to use immersive experiences to get away from the branding that Meta has done around metaverse as a concept and saying it's a three-dimensional environment that you are interacting with peers. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of learning how to navigate that world, learning how it's different, uh, and then learning how the possibilities are different. And let me give you a really simple example. Uh, you know, um, I was in there just the other day because we're going to be doing a little bit of a show and tell with some local business, uh, you know, business media. And I was like, well, let me write on the whiteboard. And so you grab a pen and you write on the whiteboard and they're like, you know, you can do that, but you can do other things. It's like, oh, I know I can bring a presentation in here and I can put my pre presentation, you know, in the immersive environment. Yeah, that's true. But did you ever think about actually, you know, if you wanted to highlight the experience, bringing like, let's say, you know, and, and the person used this example, which I thought was an amazing example. It's like, let's say you were teaching, you know, the, the history of music and you wanted to give an example of how, you know, kind of rap has impacted American society. Instead of putting your PowerPoint that you you have typically prepared for that, what if you brought Tupac Shakur and the three-dimensional version of him to be in the classroom with you to be able to for him to sing a song and then maybe for you to have a conversation with him? Because we can integrate generative AI into the back end and we can create a conversational bot for you with uh, with Tupac. And that was the mind blowing moment, right? Which is you could redesign the concept of education uh, in this immersive world because you have a new medium. Just like, you know, when you and I were earlier in our career and the internet came, you could redefine the way that business worked through what the internet gave us. We now have our next version of that, uh, you know, with things like immersive experiences. So we're early. But what it shows is that, you know, um, and, you know, what we see is that the, the, the young people in our classes, they pick up this stuff, even if they haven't experienced it, they learn it very, very quick. And within 10 minutes, they're telling me things I haven't figured out yet. But then a lot of them experienced it because the gaming community has kind of jumped there. Right now, we have some things to work out. Like, how do we how does this become more affordable and more accessible? You know, so we don't create a digital divide around these, you know, these types of experiences that you can have them or you can't have them. But it just shows you that, you know, we have this kind of ability to, you know, to rethink how we do things in a much more three-dimensional and immersive way. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. It's trippy. And I'm thinking of all sorts of uh, different applications. Trippy is a very good word for it because when you get in there and I use the young people to mentor me on this stuff because like my mind can't get there and then they explain something and I'm like, I, I, I can connect the dots now that you've kind of walked me through it. Like the Tupac example was a great, you know, it's like, you know, that content exists. You can import that content in and I could have a sit down with Tupac Shakur in a three-dimensional setting that everyone is experiencing in 3D. Wow. That's, that's trippy. Yeah. That's yeah. For, no doubt about that. And, and weren't you saying that the students also sort of help design everything like help? Yeah. Design? Yeah. Yeah. Again, and what I've found, and again, this is kind of in working, being at a university, which, you know, you, you know, most of my career has been in healthcare, but you know, the component of, uh, you know, being at a research university with a health enterprise has allowed me to understand a new industry in education, you know, and more and more as I've kind of figured out how to leverage students as part of the talent base, a lot of these cutting edge things, we we get the students involved in kind of how we think about them and how we design them. So our whole, uh, you know, immersive experience, you know, the, the environment, the platform has been designed by our students. Right. You know, the pedagogy and the class, you know, you know, the, the classwork is all, you know, been is figured out by the professor, you know, which which it needs to be. But all the environmental things, all the setup has been student designed, which is really cool because those students have gotten a great experience. Uh, and, you know, the demand, you know, uh, we were looking at some things last week, again, pointed out by a student. Apple already has postings, right, for, you know, their vision, you know, for to work with their SDK on their Vision Pro, even though the, the goggles aren't released yet. They've got the SDK out there for to play with and there are jobs starting to be posted. Well, guess what? The students who design that actually are, you know, 90% of the way to saying, I've actually done it. I don't just want to start playing with this. Yeah, no, that's really cool. What about healthcare? Because as you mentioned, you know, you have a deep care background and now you have this educational experience and we're talking about the immersive education. 
what sort of applications have you thought about how this might be useful, something like this in healthcare? Yeah, yeah. So I think we we've already seen some, but I would call them, you know, early generation. They're gonna they're gonna evolve to take full advantage as these things become more mature, more compatible. But you have certain elements of simulation that have been brought into three dimensional world. You know, some some medical schools are bringing in kind of uh, virtual versions of training for certain types of procedures. So you got simulations, you've got, you know, all sorts of digital twin technology being developed for facilities to basically understand things like flow, patient flow and all those types of things. And then what I've seen early stages on are, you know, applications that can be supportive of things in mental health and uh, physical therapy using these type of three dimensional immersive worlds, putting a headset on. But let me give you one. Right. So let's say that's early generation. But what about and you talk about trippy? I'm going to give you a trippy example here. A lot of research going on in, in the role of, uh, of psychedelics, you know, controlled you know, uh, therapeutic uses of psychedelics. What if you combine some of that psychedelic use with immersive experiences and have kind of a guided immersive psychedelic treatment? for someone with some type of, you know, um, uh, behavioral or mental disorder. And so it just kind of shows you that there are young people out there, old people out there who are pushing on the boundaries of ideas and use of these technologies. But I think what we're going to find with healthcare is, you know, it's going to move at the pace that we typically use in healthcare, which is we're going to try things, we're going to study them, we're going to do pilots, we're going to argue over, you know, whether these things, how these things need to be regulated, and at some point they start to catch critical mass and you start to see them more. But I think we're going to see a lot of kind of innovation around the use of these technologies over time. Yeah, that was really exciting. And as you point out, we've done a little bit. I know at the clinic when I was there, we were doing cadaverless, you know, classes and training in the medical school. And I remember uh, my boss at the time, uh, Dr. Uh, Toby Cosgrove, who is, you know, a famous heart surgeon. He's like, after he went in there and did the 3D and immersive and, and the walk around in the heart chambers and look around, he said, wow, I, di I didn't know this was what it was like. You know, even though he had done, you know, 10,000, probably more than that, thousands, thousands of operations, uh, when he got it in there, like in immersive, it, it like changed even his sort of view of things. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be super interesting. And I'm glad there's there's individuals like you helping the next generation, you know, in all this training. And, and as you said, they're helping you as well. And uh, and really bringing that to the forefront, because I think it can have massive potential to improve our experiences in healthcare, which we talk about a lot. So that is so cool. So I imagine, can they Google this, like find at UC some of this information or what's going on, or is it still early? Yeah, you, yeah early, early stage, but you'll find it on your social media. I mean, you can find it on social media for stuff. You know, uh, my office in the business school, we've been kind of promoting, you know, again, we're only three weeks into the course, right? We've been talking about it since about February of this year. It took that long to design and kind of figure it out. But we're three weeks into the class. But already the students have lots of really, really great feedback for us to think about like, what's our next step from here? And we're starting to, you know, to, to garner, um, uh, you know, both media attention, but also other organizations calling us and saying, hey, we saw this. We'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, because there, there is just, you know, there, there's a, there's a, an effort to get to being able to do even what we're doing that we underestimated, you know, even though we had talked to some people who had done it before us, it just, you know, there's a, there's a foundational component here, but that foundational component is already saying this foundation will help us with other things like virtual campus visits of prospective students in the future uh, in a way that is completely different uh, and much more tailored than what they experience today because our ability to bring three dimensions to it and to really personalize what they do, where they go, who they interact with. So these are things that are now on the drawing board for, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we launch into this space? Yeah, no, that's super exciting. You know, we jumped in the middle into leadership and then came back out because it's just uh, went nicely with the flow. And then now we've just talked about immersive education, which is super, super exciting. So back on leadership, what what's the hardest part of your role? So you were so used to a lot of, well, you've had a lot of different roles as we established, but definitely on healthcare side, and you've been in education for a while, uh, but what's the hardest part of your role? Yeah, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I would say the hardest part of the role is, is, getting and holding people's attention about the possibilities, right? I mean, every organization struggles with the, the 
what I call the tyranny of the urgent, right? Yeah. It is a lot of energy, both organizational capacity, but also management attention to make things run and to deal with the, the dynamic things that happen just in making the place run the way it's supposed to run. And then you have this, you know, unfortunately limited remaining capacity to think about innovation uh, and making things better. And then the conversation between, are we talking about something that's very incremental in the one and 2% versus something that's transformational? You know, my role is really designed to, to, to have someone who wakes up every day thinking about that because we have tremendous chief information officers in the place who are running a lot of criti mission critical technology and are really good at it. Matter of fact, I would say in both cases, better CIOs than I ever was. Uh, and so, um, and so, but but I bring this kind of perspective of one thinking about how can things be different, bringing it into a business or institutional context, which is not leading with technology, but how it, how is education changing and how is the threat of the landscape? How is healthcare, you know, the healthcare marketplace starting to change? For example, you know, I was at Becker's, you were at Becker's, I was there talking about uh, retail disruption and what they're going to do to address, you know, kind of the, the the missing component of primary care physicians for 100 Americans. So I think, you know, so it's like getting that attention and then holding on to it and not letting the tyranny, the urgent pull back into, we're just going to do the same thing we did yesterday, but methodically trying to help us have that portfolio of things that are moving us forward, which help us both in the way that we run and in the outcomes that we get, but also in building our reputation. I think that's the other thing of having been a business leader and having to look at things like market share, brand positioning. I bring that into a context of, of you know two industries that don't usually spend a lot of time thinking about that. So a lot of my initiatives are also about how does it help reposition the organization to be seen as one of the most innovative, thought-provoking organizations in our our respective uh, sectors. Yeah, no, that's super cool. Look, you you do so many different things, and I know you're a family man as well. How what how do you recharge your batteries? Like, because you know you're always like doing great things for great organizations. Yeah, so I think there's uh, a, a couple of things I, I like to do. One is I have this kind of component. It's like my, my wife and I argue whether it's really an outside interest or an extension of my professional capacity. I have a tremendous kind of um, both personal interest, but it touches my professional world in terms of sick care, you know, the sick care system versus the healthcare system and what's happening on the whole. How do we keep people from becoming patients in the first place? How do we take patients who have started down the road of chronic diseases and stabilize and move them back in the other direction? And how is technology and data and the consumer movement driving that? Uh, I'm a practitioner because I fall into that, you know, that segment of, of right. society that really doesn't want to be a patient. And so, and so, you know, there's this whole kind of world that I step outside and I bring some of my expertise on how we're hacking the food system, you know, to quote unquote, really build more nutrition into the food and snack industry, such that it's not empty calories of a Dorito, but think of a, you know, a redesigned Dorito that delivers you eight grams of protein and, and, and six grams of fiber, right? So I, for me, it's an outside interest because it's outside of my day job, but my wife says it's not just like more of the other things. Uh, the, the second thing is, you know, uh, you know, we live close to the ocean, so I'm able to take advantage of, you know, kind of, a, you know, an ocean and beach lifestyle with my wife and I, we have, uh, you know, we have dogs that have replaced our children that they've moved away and, and we just, you know, are always the place where people kind of come to congregate. So we call it, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, Casa de Andriola because it always seems that we are hosting guests in the guest room uh, because of our location. So that's that's a great distraction for me, just being able to recharge with, you know, with with friends and family. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I love is is the investment in the people. Uh, you know, I've I've you know really invested into trying to help uh, people become stronger leaders and have more agency over their careers. I've been able now to extend that and work with students. And so we have a whole program that I work with students and really help them prepare for their careers. And it's in the form of competitions and opportunities to listen to, you know, people who've built successful careers and, um, you know, and so that, so those are the things that I would say kind of really investing into helping, helping people grow, investing into individuals. Uh, and then the little bit of taking advantage of nature and friends to you know, recharge the batteries. Well, I think everyone can now see why I'm a big uh, Tom 
fan. Uh, Tommy's just so so full of wisdom and, and different ideas. Uh, we, we cover a lot of areas here. Uh, is there anything I missed or anything you want to double double down on? I'll give you the last word. No, I think the double down is is you know I think it's an exciting period. You know, it's you know. Uh, Technology has been kind of the, the the driver of the ability to think creatively, right? Technology we think of as being a left brain analytical, but it, the, the, the creativity I think we're going to see in the next decade to rethink the way we can do things because of what technology is giving us. And it's, you know, it's, it's generative AI, it's immersive experiences. I think we're going to see things and, you know, ultimately with uh, things like decentralized finance, that's going to, you know, create some really interesting plays. But as we saw in during the internet, it's the combination of things. Yeah. It's not any one technology. It's the combination of things and then creative minds that really, um, you know, create what becomes, Nets, you know, Netflix in a really completely different way of consuming content that has, you know, kind of transformed our lives, maybe for the better, maybe not so, right? Um, uh, you know, and so I think these types of, I think we're sitting into a really creative period here, um, stimulated by technology. And I just hope that people kind of take advantage of it uh, because we can build, you know, great careers and we can really address some of society's toughest challenges with creativity. So that's the double down moment. That's so awesome. Tom, thanks again for joining us. And again, if you want more, Tom, check out Digital Voices. Uh, you can just look him up by name and you'll find him in one of our episodes, which is really awesome as well. Tom, again, thank you so much for being part of Ed Talks. Ed, thank you.